if this isn't uh, too radical, is <clears throat> to what degree do you think actually that what we are doing now matters in the creation of the future? And if there is any possibility that what we do matters in the creation of the future, what kind of future or what kind of change are we trying to create? And to what degree what we are actually doing, for example, what we are talking about today, what we are doing today, to what degree could that possibly be a real effect, a real benefit in um, creating the future that we want to create in contrast to other things that we might do, like go to the beach and pray or whatever. <laughs> And particularly, <laughs> should I stop here? Well, that's well, one. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I'm trying to make this easier for you because I think this might be too difficult. Uh, as we. Well, I mean, I think I said this morning, or maybe I didn't, but I believe it and have said it many times. Salvation is an act of cognitive apprehension, so we do matter because to the degree that we are ignorant of vidya in the, in the Buddhist lexicon, we retard universal progress towards some kind of enlightenment. But the doctrine of avidya, this is standing for all time since 1800 BC. Do you agree that this is a special moment? Yes, I think so. Not only a special moment, but the other thing I would call people's attention to is the fact that no matter whether you scammed your way in here today and no matter whether you're going to go back to a appliance box that you live in under a bridge, the odds are that you, you are very close to the top of the pyramid of global empowerment. You are mostly white, mostly well-educated, mostly have enough disposable income to come to an event like this, it's worth pointing out that all that rides on the backs of those who do not have such privilege. And so, yeah, this is a moment of enormous opportunity and those who find themselves in this moment with power, defined however you care to define it, have a moral obligation uh, to act. And I don't advocate a certain political agenda, not that we must become Marxists or that we must become anything. What we must become is clear. Uh, we have the technologies and the informational structures and all the necessary abilities to create paradise on earth, to lift up the least among us to at least an acceptable uh, level of comfort and freedom. Why do we not do that? Because what stands in our way is our own minds, our own habits. We must change our minds. That's the most powerful political work people in this room could do. And there is nobody who is so enlightened that they don't need to work on themselves and do this. To the degree that we can change our minds, we will escape extinction, marginality, and so forth and so on. And to the degree that we cannot change our minds, we will prolong the agony, perhaps unto death and extinction, perhaps only making the struggle more difficult. But yes, this is a moment of enormous a yes. opportunity. We have a yes. A yes. <laughs> So we, uh, you, you agree that it's a moment of special opportunity over the long and short scales of time according to um, either mathematics or novelty theory? Yes. And you <laughs> agree that we have a responsibility to do our best? Yes. And what you have to tell us is that if the 200 of us here change our minds, that that would somehow have an ameliorative effect on the rest of the world and our creation of the future. Yes. How? <laughs> How would it have this effect? Yes. By telepathic means, 
By the romance of photons? No, I think by the spread of clarity. The spread of clarity, the elimination of redundancy in the system, and uh, uh, the spreading of a sense of shared purpose and the possibility of achieving that purpose. It doesn't matter what you do beyond changing your mind for a, a better clarity? Well, I don't want to say absolutely it doesn't matter, but I think that's the first obligation. If you charge you, off with some political agenda that is not informed by clarity, you're going to end up with business as usual. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, <laughs> but it is not paved with clarity. <laughs> So your, uh, for example, what you do in my, if you barnstorm giving lectures, you write books and you create a website. And the effect of this, hopefully, will be to promote clarity. Correct. <laughs> well, first of all, I certainly agree that for me personally, psychedelic experience has enhanced clarity, whereas some people think the opposite. Well, let us have vigorous debate by informed parties <laughs> on the <this> subject. <laughs> Don't forget, I've given over 300 calculus lectures in this room. <laughs> it boggles my mind to look out and think, well, yeah, this is Santa Cruz. This must be Santa Cruz. You know, this is the real Santa Cruz. The, the question really is, I mean, changing minds, we're talking, the, you were talking about the butterfly wing effect. The question is, if we change our minds, can it have a larger effect on other people's minds? Yes. Because if we decide to recycle yet more newspaper and so on, it's not going to have that much effect. The, the changing mind thing, the butterfly wing analogy, suggests some major change of mind spreading through our culture. Now, I suspect that you think the medium for this transformation is the World Wide Web. I suspect that Terence thinks the medium Well, is. I think telepathy is equally powerful. Yes, but... Um, Wait, I want to hear his suspicion of me. <laughs> World well, Wide Web? Yes, I no, think... No, no, psychedelic drugs. World Wide Web, psychedelic drugs. <laughs> I don't, I still haven't understood the psychedelic drug agenda. We, Britain has the highest percentage of psychedelic drug consumption in the Western world at the moment. And it's not entirely clear that this has resulted in clarity spreading through. <laughs> Britain is the source of, and um, the fountainhead of the worldwide youth culture that is creating the new music, the new dance, the new forms of, uh, community and the new resistance to consumerist values. So don't sell the old UK Come short. to the rave tonight yes. and see clarity <laughs> created. <laughs> yes, yes, the, a crucible of clarity as home at last goes. <laughs> <laughs> and Terence takes the microphone. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not always perfectly clear, perfectly clear what's going on when you have your nose in it, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, my own agenda relies partly on the World Wide Web, not as strongly as yours. And I, uh, here in this room is Matthew Clapp, who kindly runs my World Wide website. Um, Shellbreak.org. Yes. <laughs> so... But my own view is that this clarity involves breaking the spell of rationalism, Cartesianism, a spell woven more powerfully than ever before this morning by Terence. Um, I mean, it took on a new level of spellbinding uh, in the way you described it. It's to recognize that we're far more interconnected, uh, we're far more participatory in our relation with the world than this cognitive um, kind of science and cognitive model of the mind would tell us. And so I think the secret to waking us up, one of the secrets, is psychic pets. As you know, this is one of my particular <laughs> themes. 
Um, and the purpose of... I wrote a book which some of you may have seen called Seven Experiments That Could Change the World. The purpose of this was to find simple experiments that could give us clarity on issues uh, that we know about already, which could actually have a transformative effect on our view of the world. They're to do with changing our scientific view of the world. And the scientific view of the world is a particularly important part of the spell that binds us all and that affects our whole um, civilization, our whole industrial culture. And it's an exceptionally narrow and dissociated view of the world at the moment. The reason I think psychic pets could play this part is, first of all, there's more of them than psychedelics. I mean, they're everywhere. Um, there are lots and lots of dogs and cats that have telepathic bonds with their owners. About 50% of Americans feel that they've had a telepathic bond with an animal. Now, to recognize what so many people already know, through experiments to test these to see if they're real, and so far the experiments suggest they are real, um, this can give permission for people to recognize what they already know. Then all these closet holists, uh, are, or most of us are closet holists, can come out and um, recognize that there's this kind of interconnection with other species and with each other uh, that's been going on all the time, but which has been suppressed from the level of supposedly rational discourse by the idea that this is all superstition, it's not scientific, it's irrational, and so forth. I think that the, one of the big difficulties in our culture is the split between the rational educated part of our minds, which we put on in public, and the participatory sense of connection which we have at home with gardens, plants, children, animals, lovers, to solving the eco ecological problems of the world, to dealing with the problem of multinational corporations and so on. But it's a step towards clarity and it's one that could spread very quickly. Well, it seems to me the overarching theme here that unites all three of our positions is boundary dissolution. Psychedelic drugs dissolve boundaries. The World Wide Web dissolves boundaries, and certainly the discovery that our pets are communicating, anticipating, and understanding us is a boundary-dissolving perception. Uh, so really what we're saying is we must dissolve the artificial boundaries that confine our perceptions. Someone once said, if we could feel what we are doing to the Earth, we would stop immediately because a man hitting himself on the head with a ball-peen hammer stops immediately. The feedback <laughs> loop is very short. So we have compartmentalized our lives, and this allows us to do the fatal and lethal work that is destroying the planet, destroying community, so forth and so on. Uh, so maybe three answers as diverse as you've just heard here, you might search your own soul and ask uh, what obsession or interest of mine would contribute to the grand project of boundary dissolution. Uh, certainly, it is not the affirmation of cultural values. Culture is a scheme for maintaining and creating boundaries. It replaces reality with a, a linguistically supported delusion, and behind that delusion then pogroms, programs of genocide, arms races, sexism, racism, all can operate very, very comfortably. Uh, Ralph earlier mentioned love. Uh, generally speaking, love is a boundary dissolving enterprise. So I think each of us, the three of us, all of you, in our way, should find ways to express love. And it's not, it's not treacly, it's not woo-woo, it's a very practical matter that has thousands of expressions. As long as we believe in mind and matter, rich and poor, living and dead, aboriginal and advanced, black and white, man and woman, then we're inevitably going to carry on a dualistic analysis of our dilemma and we're going to produce incomplete agendas and answers. <clears throat>